Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you once again for joining us uh, at our FAS Devi Synagogue uh, Sunday night uh, lecture series. And tonight we have the opportunity to hear from a talented uh, young novelist, Alyssa Friedland, um, who also uh, happens to be a member of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue. We want to thank you for your time this evening. I know you're very, very busy. We want to thank you and your family for everything uh, that uh, we do, uh, that you do for, uh, for the community and our shul. And please God, only happy occasions uh, for you and your children and your husband and the entire family for, for many, many uh, years. To introduce, oh, to introduce uh, this evening's speaker, uh, we have Elizabeth uh, Winter. You know, Liz's uh, family has a long history at the Fifth Avenue Synagogue. I believe now, uh, Mark and Sai and, and Larry's children, the fifth generation uh, that is uh, engaged in our, in our shul. There's a Feuerstein Heyman uh, Torah in the synagogue arc. Many uh, celebrations that took place in the shul, family celebration, celebrations, including uh, Larry's uh, bar mitzvah, what was in the shul. We are so, uh, are so grateful uh, to Liz's family for their friendship and for everything they've done for our community for uh, decades. And how many decades is it? I don't, you would know. It's a uh, lot of decades, Rabbi. A lot of decades. Oh, no, I might go back to the beginning. Yeah. yeah. And also, only happy occasions and uh, simcha coming up in the family. And please, God, it should be the start of many, many, many uh, joyous occasions and good health uh, for, for many years. Amen. I'm very grateful for Liz uh, to introduce uh, her dear friend, uh, our guest speaker to, tonight, to formally introduce her. Um, please, uh, Liz. Okay, so hi, everybody. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this special event. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to have the distinct pleasure of getting to introduce our very special guest tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know me, the rabbi just outed me a little bit, told you who I am, but I'm Elizabeth Heyman Winter, and probably in this crowd, I'm better known as Larry Heyman's little sister. Might be the only place where I'm known as, as that, but... Um, our guest tonight is a longtime member of the synagogue, wife to William, mother to Charlie, Lila, and Sam, an accomplished lawyer, a Yale professor of creative writing, and a prolific author. Um, but lucky me, and perhaps her most important <laughs> title, which at least for me is the title of my best friend. So I feel very fortunate to have such a creative, accomplished, smart, funny, best friend. Um, and of course, the woman I'm speaking about is Alyssa Friedland. Um, Alyssa is the author of four books now. Um, her third novel, which is the one we're gonna be discussing tonight, was called The Floating Feldmans and was received with rave reviews as witty, heartwarming, um, laugh out loud funny, um, and just delightful all around. Um, her next book, The Last Summer at the Golden Hotel, um, will be out in May. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and without any further ado, uh, the woman, the myth, the legend, Alyssa Friedland, my best friend and author. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Liz. That's the best introduction I've ever gotten. So thank you so much. And I've had a lot of opportunities to talk. Um, I've been a member of Fifth Avenue Synagogue for 15 years. Um, I was welcomed very warmly into the community when I started dating William, whose family were longstanding members. And William is very actively involved now in the renovation of the synagogue and spends more time taking care of Fifth Avenue Synagogue than talking to me. So the person everyone really owes a debt of gratitude is William. But um, thank you for inviting me. I'd love to talk about the Floating Feldmans, being a writer, life in the pandemic, writing about Jewish themes, anything that, uh, I don't know whoever's kicking it off with questions. I'm happy to discuss anything. So so, so thank you, Alyssa, for uh, giving us your, your valuable time tonight. And also uh, thank you for giving us William to help uh, the shul out of uh, in a very important uh, task that he's leading. But uh, I wanted to ask you if, if you could maybe um, tell us about your third book, The Floating Feldmans. There, there's a lot of people on the phone that have read it and there's some that haven't. So if you could just spend some time and uh, 
tell us about the book. I appreciate that. Yes, definitely. So the Floating Feldmans is a multiple point of view story um, about a Jewish family, the Feldmans, who are from Long Island, and there are grandparents, two middle-aged children, and two grandchildren who um, are now spread out across the country, and they're not quite an estranged family. They do speak to each other, but they're not close like they once were. And the grandmother, Annette Feldman, is having a milestone birthday. And for various reasons, I don't wanna give away any spoilers, but for various reasons, um, she decides that it's a, a perfect time for the family to take a cruise together and to spend some time together. And so she calls her two grown children and tells them about this plan. And they feel pretty guilted uh, into saying yes, and they spend one week together on a big cruise ship um, on a Caribbean trip, on a Caribbean tour. So that is what the book is about. And everybody who gets on the boat in the family has some secret of a varying degree. And uh, the secrets all come to light on the boat. Okay, so later on, uh, Rachel Ackengold is more familiar with that book, might have some questions, but I wanted to really focus on you as an author. Um, so, I, you know, I wanted to know uh, if you would share with us, you know, being an author is a major accomplishment. Uh, Liz said you, you've already done four books. Can you tell us when, when did you think about becoming an author and give us some background sure. on so how that I, process came about, please? I wanted to be an author from the time I was about six or seven years old. I always loved writing. It's a tremendous passion wow. of mine. It's really like, what I said, if you asked me when I was a kid what I wanted to be, it would either be a journalist or a writer, a novelist. I was a tremendous reader as a child and read like, you know, five or six books a week. It's something I wish my, kid, my kids did more of, but there's definitely so much more distraction now than when I was a child. I mean, I had a Nintendo Game Boy that the battery would die after using it for an hour. Now my kids have like seven different consoles that they can use for video games. It's harder, but I feel lucky that I grew up in a time where there wasn't that much else going on and I spent a tremendous amount of time reading and that encouraged me on my career um, path. But I, I didn't get there directly. I went to Yale and I took a lot of writing and English classes, but ultimately um, wasn't sure how to graduate and make a career of this because it's like a very amorphous path and I'm definitely a very type A person. So for me, it was like, how do I can't just like graduate from Yale and then go sit in Starbucks all day on my laptop. First of all, like I wanted to make some money and needed to make some money. And I also needed, felt like I went to school for four years, I should have a proper job. And I, I went to law school, felt like a very safe route. I went to Columbia. I met William while I was a student at Columbia while he was living in New York. And we just, we met at a APAC event actually got married. I ended up working at a major law firm for three years. And even though it was a very nice firm, I just never felt excited to go to work. Like I would wake up and just kind of drag my heels, go through the motions, never felt excited about getting a new assignment. I'm just sort of bored by my job. And I would see William who works in real estate, so passionate about his career and like want to go to work and be so excited to tell me, all the developments that were happening at his company. And I was like, I just don't feel that way about what I'm doing and I could be happier. I quit my job and I decided to make a go of writing full time. It was scary, but I did it. And it was not an easy path and there was plenty of rejection when I first started. But I think that's sort of part and parcel of being a writer. Like you have to get used to rejection because it's very subjective. So you have a great product, but you know, it needs to connect with the right literary agent. You need to correct, connect with the right editor. That's all happened for me now. And I'm on, you know, I've finished my fourth book. I'm starting my fifth book now. I've really sit, successfully transitioned careers, but it was not super easy. Thanks for sharing that detail. So, um, so you're, you're working at a law firm, you see William's excitement about work and you're like, you don't have that excitement and you go back to your passion when you were six or seven years old. Can you, can you walk through, you know, you, you, I guess you, you resign from your firm and then start writing or did you start writing? In other words, maybe help educate us on, on that process in a little more so specificity. I, I wanted to just 
be certain that I had the discipline to write because it's just like you don't have a boss, you're doing it all by yourself, especially in the beginning when you don't have any deadlines and you don't have an editor and you don't have anything you have to turn in. So I actually started writing on maternity leave while I was at the law firm and I was off for 12 weeks and I wrote a lot and I really enjoyed it. And I felt like I do have the discipline to sit in a chair and stare at a computer. It's super solitary, but I'm okay with that because I'm really engaged when I'm writing. And I got a lot done during that maternity leave and that gave me the confidence to quit my job because I saw that I am okay to set my own internal deadlines. Like I'm, if I say I have to finish something by September 30th, but it's just a self-imposed deadline, I meet that deadline. Like I take my own deadlines very seriously. So that was very informative for me. So, so tell, tell us about, uh, you know, the, the deadlines, like, so you're creating deadlines based on what? In other words, uh, some people take 10 years to write, a, like, d different people take different lanes to write a book. So right. you, you, you're creating like a six month deadline and one year deadline. So um, none of my books have been very research heavy. And I think a lot of the times when a novelist takes like eight to 12 years to write a book. It's often because there's a tremendous amount of research. I also think there's like some element of perfectionism that can get in the way and you have to know like when you have to be done. Cause I could pick up any of my books that have already been published and reread a paragraph in them and realize all the places that it could be better. That will always be the case. Like it can always be better, but if you keep up with that mentality, you'll never publish a book. You have to get to a point and it's not just that I decide, it's also an editor, a, a publishing house decides, like we've gotten into a place that it deserves to be out into the world. It's good, it's it's worthy. And, uh, and when it's at that place, it gets published. So I think not letting perfectionism, it's, it's one thing to strive for excellence, but not for perfectionism, um, not for perfection. And I think that's really important. And since I don't have very research heavy books, I am able to work rather quickly. I'm also a very fast person, like I just do, everything really quickly in my life. Like if I have to pay bills, I'm done in 10 minutes. Like I move very fast. So, and writing comes to me very quickly, which it does not to all writers, but I happen to be writing a novel now with a friend. She's exactly like me. We're very quick. We each can write a chapter in a day. Like I can imagine that writing project would wow. be so difficult if I was with a partner who was maybe an equally talented writer, but just took more time. Like we're, We've matched up, like when you do a collaborative project, you have to match up not only in like writing style and skill, but also in like your work ethic and how quickly you can produce. So I happen to be able to produce quickly, which has enabled me to have a book come out either every year or every other year, which is, which is good. I mean, it keeps me very wow. good. So, so how'd you decide fiction, nonfiction? Was, was there a process or you, you just jumped into one area? No process. I've just like, I'm very creative. So like for me, and I hate research. So that was like something in law school. I hated, <laughs> I knew I was never going to go into, um, into like prosecution or any, you know, I was always interested in like doing the corporate work, never anything that would involve me going into like case history and reading a lot of old cases because I cannot stand research. And I'm very creative. So like when it comes time to like telling my children a story at the end of the day, like, without much uh, forethought, I'm able to come up with like a very creative children's story that they love. And you know, that's just the way my brain works. And it's, it, I guess, naturally a creative person that has a tremendous aversion to research. So nonfiction would never be my speed. <laughs> Got it. So, so, so tell us about the ideas. Were the ideas in your childhood, you already had them and you just implemented them later in life or? To tell well, us about, I mean, four, four books is a lot for as someone our age. So tell us so, about that process. So my first book, which is like, I think actually even more relevant today, came very much from something that I had observed in life. It, it's called Love and Miscommunication. And it's about a woman who's super addicted to her cell phone. And she's, it's not even just that she's always checking her text messages like a nervous tick. It's that she's just really living her entire life online. And 
she's just constantly like if someone wants to set her up on a date she can't just have a leap of faith and say okay you think i might like this man i'm going to go out and meet him no she has to do like a full colonoscopy online of this man so that there's really very little mystery left when she meets the person if, if she meets a new even a new friend she was looking them up and, and just sort of inundated with information and also worrying way too much about the way she herself was presented online studying her Facebook profile and her Instagram profile and making sure that she was putting out the right package. Ultimately, when she lets that go and decides to live off the grid for a year and her life happens more organically, things work out in a way that's very unexpected and wouldn't have happened if she was still constantly Googling everything. Um, my second novel, I wanted to grow as a writer, so it was very important to me to not just have a single female narrator because the first book was very much like her life situation was different, my main character, than me, but she had very much had my same personality and my same neuroses. And so I wanted to write about people who were nothing like me and I wanted to try to write about, to try to write from a male perspective. So my second book was about um, a complicated marriage um, where the, uh, husband and wife decide to take a six month break from their marriage to see if they're happier apart or together. And what I learned from that experience is one, I love writing somebody who's different from myself. Like it flexed a totally different creative muscle being able to write from a man's perspective and also writing characters that had no similarity to me. Um, I would also say the multiple point of view, I got really hooked on it because you can start, you can tell the same scene from two different or more to multiple points of view. And you realize that different people like the same three people can go see the same movie, walk out with totally different opinions or meet a new person. And one person thinks, oh, that person was so lovely. And the other thinks they were a jerk. And like it, we all, or even sometimes I see this with my own husband, like, you know, I think I'm being nice. He thinks I'm being snippy. Like we all are interpreting tone and there's, and so when you can get into multiple heads in a story, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, so I love that. And then there's the Floating Feldmans, um, which is nine main characters, because I wanted everybody in the family to have a voice. And then I've stuck, again, with the multiple point of view, um, the multiple point of view concept for my novel that's coming out in May, which also has a lot of main characters. And it's about two Jewish families that co-own a Catskills resort that is up for sale. That's a, that sounds great. So, 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 um... You know, being an author, I'm, uh, you know, just getting the books out is, is a lot. But can you maybe, for people that are on the call that maybe have a passion to do it, can you tell us a little bit about the financials? Meaning, like, in other words, uh, what does it cost to produce a book? Mm -hmm. What's the break, break even? Do sure. books, like, do you have, like, one year or do they, you know, uh, I've never... I don't know the space, so if you could educate. No, of us, course, and I didn't. I didn't know the space at all either. Um, most publishers lose money on every book they publish, and are carried by a few of the major successes. So they'll buy a thousand books. If we're talking about the major publishing houses, like they'll buy a thousand books in a year, and they'll put out a thousand books in a year, but their entire, you know, operating expenses are covered by the success of. 50 of those thousand books. Um, so authors are given advances for their books and then that is credited against future sales. For an author to earn out against their advance, is, it's pretty rare. And even like, I mean, there was like a famous where like Hillary Clinton didn't come anywhere near earning out her huge advance for her memoir. Um, it, it's it's rare and, and basically when an if you get a decent size advance, it often means that the publisher is investing in you. They don't necessarily expect you to earn out for that book, but they want to grow you as an author. Now, that doesn't mean they're necessarily losing a tremendous amount of money because they are still, it's, it's just about, I think it's something like if you have an advance of $100,000, you need to sell roughly half the amount of books, 50,000 books to earn out. I mean, that's a that's a very loose answer and it's not exact a loose calculation because books go on sale very frequently and so the price point is very different and there are times where kindle will run a sale of your book 
and it's a dollar ninety nine or ninety nine cents, and all of a sudden you'll sell five thousand books when it goes on sale. So it's not quite so easy to say that like you have to sell half the amount of your advance, but some people use that as a back of the envelope calculation. So, so it sounds like you, the most important thing is having the right publisher. And once you find the right publisher, you're sort of married to that publisher because they're investing in you early on. It's like venture capital. Eventually they're going to, you're going to hit a home run that's going to make up for the, the books that don't, that they don't break even on is it, meaning well, that's, you, don't, you don't switch publishers every other book evidently well that's certainly the publishers hope when they pay you um, but publishers drop authors all the time if they don't see a growth potential and you talked about before about whether do you have a year i mean some books have an unbelievable tale there's a book that just celebrated 100 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, which is Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. I'm sure if there are book lovers on this Zoom, they've read it. Um, wildly successful book. Uh, why that book has a 100 week tale and continues to sell amazingly well. I don't know, I really liked it, but sometimes there's an, I, it wasn't the best book I've ever read though. Sometimes there's just an alchemy and a right time, right place for certain books that give them these tremendous tales. And other books, like I've read some fabulous books, but then I go on Amazon to see their rating and I see all they've received are like 30 or 40 ratings, which is very little. You, you can see based on the number of Amazon ratings that a book has received, how well it's sold. And there are so many incredible books that just don't reach people. It's not a very, I wouldn't say it's like the easiest profession to be in. And as far as like a publisher, like your first, the first thing you have to do is find a literary agent because you can't just submit your work to a publisher unless it goes through an agent first. So you have many chances to get rejected if you're a writer. First you get rejected by agents, then you can get rejected by publishers. You become a um, very thick skinned until it works out. So, so can you talk a little bit about, uh, so at six or seven you decide that's your passion, you're, you enjoy writing, you're a very creative writer. Was there an author that you thought of that inspired you that you wanted to be like, or are you really just an entrepreneur following your own path? Meaning, you know, maybe tell us about when you were a child, was it someone you looked up to as an author that inspired you, or was it all about just something that was in you? I mean, I love Judy Bloom, and she's a children's author, young adult, but then she's transitioned and written unbelievable adult novels. So I thought I liked watching her career transition and see that she had what it takes to sell a tremendous amount of young adult novels and then also compelling, amazing um, books for adults. Um, I love Richard Russo. I'm very inspired by him. I love Jonathan Franzen. I probably idolize more literary authors. Like I tend to write more commercial books that are great for when you go on vacation and are certainly humorous. Like I love to make people laugh in my books and that's, that's sort of my specialty. But what I choose to read, I rarely choose to read humor books because like I'm very particular as a funny person. Like I generally find that like I'm funnier than most people. So <laughs> like, I don't really find that many other people funny. I, I really sure? gravitate to literary books. Got it. Now, now, just to be clear, an author can drop a publisher. You, you said a publisher can drop an author. I assume. Both, both ways. Well, it depends. Or I'm under contract now. I'm with Penguin Random House, and they own the book that's coming out in May, my fourth novel, and I owe them another novel that's coming out two years later okay. in 2023. But at that point, like I'm a free agent. They have a right of first refusal on my new material. I presume that they will buy it because we have a good relationship. And at that point, they'll have published four of my five books. Like I expect to stay with them, but you never know. And it's possible my agent, who's a shark, will want to shop around and get more money. So anything is possible. It's, it, yeah, I mean, you got to do what's best for your career, even if it's sad to leave. But I hope to stay. I'm very close with my so, editor. So, so have you thought like, uh, I'm just saying John Grisham, he, he, he's an author, but then his books became movies later on. Uh, have you, do you have any aspiration of any of your books? Because they sound fun and exciting and 
Yes. Yeah. And if you know any movie producers, like, please pass them my books. So, so actually, I was, uh, I was trying to get a movie producer on this call, but, but we'll talk <laughs> offline about that. I would have I, enjoyed I, that. I do, I, do, I do know someone really good. It just didn't work out today. But, um, but that's a, the next project when we get you I back. I mean, it's something I have a film agent who's representing the Floating Feldmans. And so far, we haven't had any bites. I'm exploring speaking to different film agents for my next, my cat skills novel. And hopefully something will happen. But oftentimes, even if you sell the film rights, like they're selling the film rights and then there's getting a film made. And there's maybe roughly 2 million hurdles in between those two steps. So right now, my short term goal is selling film rights. Actually having a movie made, that's like, you know, that's really a pipe dream, yep. but you never know. Got it. So, 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 so when, when do you find time to write? Are you writing late at night? Are you writing during the day? Are you always writing? T tell us. I'm pretty much, process. I pretty much always working. Um, I don't work late at night though. Like I cannot by 5 PM, my brain is total mush and I don't do, I, I will tend to still work on my career, but I'll do more like marketing or responding to emails, more of like the busy work. And, but the actual writing I can only do when I'm fresh and I've had a lot of coffee. Um, but it's been, the pandemic has been a little tricky because now I'm home with the children all day, every day, <laughs> nonstop. Sure. So. So, 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 what, so, so for someone that, that has an aspiration to be an author, what, what would you say is the hardest part of being an author? Like, like what is the most challenging part? That, that you think deters people from doing their passion? I think a lot of self-doubt deters people. And I think being afraid to share your work with other people. So you have your work, you read it over, but then you know it's time to get feedback, but you're so petrified of criticism that you end up holding it in the drawer, keeping it you know, on your, you know, on your computer. But if you can get over that hurdle and give the manuscripts or whatever little bits you've written to trusted people that you know you trust because they're big readers or they're in the publishing industry and you think their feedback is going to be valuable, don't just give it to one person. Also, I say give your work to three, four people and then you can aggregate their comments and you can also decide if you receive the same comment three times, there's probably some validity to it. And Sharing your work early, I think, is key to success as a writer. And you just like have to put your butt in the chair, even if it's boring, even if you'd rather be out to lunch with a friend or on the phone or checking Instagram or doing anything else that's like more fun and easier. This is a job that requires a tremendous amount of self-discipline and self-motivation. If you don't have it, it will be very hard to make a go of this. So, so, uh, yeah, so, 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 so self-motivation, self-discipline. Um, so what's the most enjoyable part of the process? Is it when the book's out and people enjoy it? In, in other words, is it, is it the creative process and jumping to the new one? You know, what, what sort of inspires well, you the most? My other writer friends inspire me the most. When I first started this, I was really basically still a lawyer. I didn't know a lot of other writers. I felt very lonely in this world. Now, at least half my friends are writers. I'm really part of a community, wow. especially living in New York City. There's so many writers and so many writing events. And we just share the same language. Like we get the business, we understand the business, and we talk to each other, each other in shorthand. And sharing, like being able to write you know, being able to, to write to like a author friend, like I just totally fixed my plot problem and like being able to describe it in shorthand and, and like share that satisfaction. And the pandemic has been very hard for me because I'm so used to going to book launches all the time and celebrating my friend's work in person. And Zoom is lovely. This is a really lovely event, but it's not the same as like giving a hug to a reader who really loved my book or especially the Floating Feldmans, which really touched a nerve with a lot of families. Then people would come over and be like, this made me cry, or this is exactly my relationship with my grandson, or I also haven't spoken to my son in a long time. And like, 
we had a lot of like cathartic moments and then all of a sudden the pandemic came and I transitioned to doing everything on Zoom and same for my friends, just going to their book events on Zoom and not being able to like go to the bookstore and buy 10 copies and give them a huge hug, you know, which is the most exciting part. It's also fun to like go on Amazon and read all your five star reviews and ignore all the one star ones like that feels good, too. So, so uh, yes, yeah, COVID is hard if, if you're a people's person and yes. you want to connect. Is there anything from COVID that helped you as an author? I mean, I'm sure people are bothering you less, so this is positive, but are there any, any ideas maybe that came out of COVID that maybe, you, you know, a book idea or something maybe mm -hmm. in the making? Not I'm not, I don't think I'm tempted, I'm not tempted to write about COVID. I wrote two funny articles about COVID that I'm trying to place in magazines because I was just feeling like, I wrote this one article that I have not published yet because I feel like my husband is like cheating on me by like lying about how careful he is about COVID. Like I know he doesn't like wash his hands as much as he's supposed to. And like, I feel like he's like not that diligent about the mask, but then he lies to me about he it. He does all the time. Really? All right. That's nice to hear. Cause I feel like in deep quarantine, no, like when you're true. supposed he's to be hideous, like he was definitely cutting corners. I'm certain of it. And so I ended up writing an article about that, that I'm hoping to place. Cause it turned out like, it's unusual for a spouse or even roommates or a mother daughter or whatever pair is living together that they would have the exact same standards for like how to treat coronavirus so i wrote about that and but as far as a novel like i am not enjoying the pandemic and i have no interest in being a part of this for 400 pages or a year which is how long it takes me to write a book so you will not find covid in any of my novels Okay, so to tell us about, uh, I think you said something very important. So there are three or four people that you trust early on in the process that help you vet your ideas is what I heard you say. Is that correct? Yes. So, 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 so finding the right three or four is huge. So tell us, you don't have to tell us who the three or four are if you don't want to, but how did you find those three or four, like 30 to break the three or four or did you just get lucky three or four early on? I reached out to people like that I knew from college who had published books and in the beginning I didn't have as many people to reach out to. I asked my mom. My mom's like a pretty honest person and like I know that she's not going to sugarcoat it and she also reads a lot. Like she's someone who reads a novel a week. I think that's also really important. Like you don't want to give like, I think William is very smart, my husband, but I really don't trust him. He doesn't read fiction. So his opinions on fiction, and especially commercial fiction, are they're not as valuable to me as they are of my, you know, compared to my mom's opinions, when this is basically all she reads, you know, a new novel once a week. So you want to find people that either write in the genre or that read in the genre. And I think you need both. You need a reader, because, like, you're ultimately not writing your book for other writers. You're writing it for readers. For, for readers, right. But writers are able to give you technical instruction. So like the reader, the smart reader might tell you, I didn't buy this plot line, but the writer friend tells you, this is how you fix it. Got it. So tell us a little bit, uh, the pricing of a book. Are all books priced in the same range? Soft cover, hard cover, who makes all mm -hmm. those decisions? Maybe talk a little bit about Amazon, how, you know, the, there aren't many bookstores today. Things are done online. You know, your opinion on that. You can give us some color, please. I mean, there has been a resurgence. Independent bookstores before the pandemic were actually doing very well. And I hope that it returns. And there were actually were a number of articles in the Wall Street Journal and in the New York Times um, really touting a return to independence. And people were sick of buying their books on Amazon and they wanted the personal touch. So I was very happy to see that trend in retail and in book selling. Amazon is cheaper. There's no question. And it's easier. And they do undercut the price of other booksellers. I mean, I read a lot on Kindle. I'm a tremendous reader. I read on Kindle, which means I'm buying my books on Amazon largely. But I try to support bookstores a lot because I know how supportive they are to me by going in and buying a ton of children's books. I'll go into, I'm in Southampton now for the quarantine. I will frequently go into the local bookstore and while I'm not gonna buy novels that I would wanna read because I'm gonna read those on my Kindle, 
I'll go in and I'll buy five, six coffee table books at a time that I then keep in my house and I just wait to give them when we're invited to somebody's house as a, as a present, or I'll go in and do a big haul of children's books since my children prefer, you know, to actually hold the book in their hand. So that's the way that I feel like I'm doing my part and supporting bookstores um, that have been so good to me and host me for events and are, you know, champions of authors. Um, pricing is, Pricing is this, you know, hardcover is expensive. It's a lot of money. I remember when my first book came out, which was a paperback, and I think it retailed for $16. And my first book, a celebrity had posted about my book on Instagram, and I was really excited. And I started to read the comments that people, some people just said, I can't wait to read it or sounds good. But there were quite a number of people that said, that sounds really good. I'm going to buy it when I get my paycheck. And the idea of, like, it was a really big wake-up call, because we can forget about that in our New York bubble, that there are plenty of people who the idea of buying, going out and buying a $16 book is not something that they can just do without thinking about it. And these people are waiting to cash their paycheck at the end of the week to be able to buy a book. Um, that also puts a lot of pressure to write some quality, because you don't like the idea of somebody earning $20 an hour and 16 of that goes to, you know, buying my book that they may or may not like, but um, it's a good wake up call. And then, so I basically, I've published most of my books in paperback. It's a much more affordable price point and it enables book, it encourages book clubs to choose the book more because there are quite a number of book clubs that have like a hard and fast paperback only rule. It's more affordable. Got it. So, so again, so you, you're on your, your fourth book is out or it's coming out, coming May. out, you said in, it's coming out in May. May. Mm -hmm. And, and your fifth book, you, you know what you're going to do or, or not yet? I do. It's called most likely. And it okay. follows a group of four women who are together at their 25th high school reunion and they go through the yearbook and they see their senior, senior superlatives, like most likely to be president, most likely to cure cancer, most likely to be in the Olympics. And they turn to each other in a very somber moment and realize they have not quite come close to what they, their hopes and dreams were when they were 18. And they have a, a year to reflect on it and make some changes. Got it. I think uh, Liz has a question. I'm going to hand it over to our CEO, Rachel, who wanted to, had some questions about the floating development. Um, Liz wanted to know, uh, give me one second. I apologize. I'm not as good with the, uh, with the chat as I should be. Tell us Let's about your a family, a family story. Yes. Um, well, I'm not organ. I'm not an organized person. I make a lot of logistical mistakes. So I would say most recently we traveled the five of us to London before the pandemic for a milestone birthday for my father-in-law. And the night before I'm on the phone and I'm so excited talking about the trip and my husband comes over to me to show me that my son's passport is expired. And we then spend the entire night online trying to find a 24 hour place, six o'clock in the morning, we show up with our son in the end, even though the party is for his father, I decide that I want to go to London more and I get on the plane with my two big children while William waits for the passport to arrive. Like we went to the post office together, this and that, and then they landed in London in time for the party. But when they landed in London, my husband turned his phone on. The message said it was time to check in for the return flight home. So he was there for, I think, 23 hours. So that's our, our most recent wow. chaos. Yeah. Okay, thank Check you. Check your sure. passports. Uh, Ray yes, by the way, you're not the first person to tell me that story, but thanks for sharing that. <laughs> the passport story, it happens a lot. It does. Rachel? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for being here. And let me just start by saying, the book is great. It's funny. It's poignant. It's a compelling story of family dynamics. And so relatable as, of course, we all deal with you know, challenging circumstances of families. Um, so what I'm going to do is moderate some of the questions that were submitted through the Q&A. And for anybody who's listening, please continue to submit any questions you have through the chat or the Q&A, and I'm happy to pass them on. Um, so the first question that came in was, how does the creative writing process work? Do you have to sit and think about the storyline for months before you put it together? How do you put it together? I think 
I know when it clicks. Like for this book I was just describing, most likely, I knew I wanted to write about women and their unfulfilled dreams. But that's a theme. That's not a plot. So I had my theme for at least, I have probably sold, signed that contract 10 months ago. That theme has been percolating in my brain for a long time. I have to start writing it now. My writer best friend and I were texting, texting, texting. I said, Catherine, I have to start. I have to start. I have to start. We hashed it up. And then literally like a bolt of lightning. I was like, I got it. I have my plot. I know exactly what to do now. It's like a eureka moment. And that's happened for all of my books. And when you start writing, do you know what the end is going to be? Or do you just begin and then the ending comes? I usually don't know the ending. I let it unfold. I don't outline my books. I like to just write and I feel more creative when I just write. Like this book that's coming out in May, which has to do with these two families that own a Catskills resort that um, a company comes in and offers to buy. There's a big question. Are they going to sell or are they going to keep it? I truly didn't know what they were going to do until I got to the place in the book where they had to make a decision. So I don't decide that in advance. You let the creative juices flow. Yeah. Um, okay. So the next question that's here says, um, it sounds like you like to write about things based off of real life. I found it easier to write or speak from the opposite point of what that person feels. How about you? Um, I mean, I take inspiration from my real life, especially humorous things, because like I'm very, I, I, I don't, I have many flaws, but one personality trait I have that's very strong is that when I'm faced with a bad situation, I'm very good at finding the humor in it. So for that, I draw on my own experience and finding a silver lining and finding the funny note in a bad thing. But I definitely write about experiences that aren't my own because now my books all have these tremendous cast of characters, like seven, eight, nine people, and I'm writing gay characters, straight characters, old characters, young characters, teenagers, boys, girls, undecideds, you know? Right. So I, I write all different types of people and it's fun. I mean, I had a character in the Floating Feldmans that's a complete and total shopaholic. Anyone who knows me knows I don't ever shop. I buy almost nothing. I despise going into stores. So like that was fun because to write about someone who gets this adrenaline and excitement from shopping when it, for me, it's the polar opposite. And all I like to do is purge my closet and I get a, I get a thrill from returning something. So that's fun. It's, it's all part of the process. Right. So I love the technique of the rotating perspectives. I think that is so much fun. Um, but I was wondering, is it harder to get into some characters' heads than others? Like, is it harder to be Mitch than Elise because he's a man? Is it harder to be Annette than Rachel because she's 70 and you are not 70? I, it was not, I would say it's not that hard for me to get into other people's heads because I'm really observant and I read a lot and I have a wide range of friends and I, you know, have my parents and my in-laws to access the older point of view and I have my nephews and nieces when I need to access teenagers. I would say the important thing is that you don't want to give anybody short shrift. So it's important when you finish the book, like that's, that's a tweak that would happen. I would be like, hmm. I'm very good to Darius, the teenage boy, and I really have like, you know, shown the reader who he is, but his sister has like really been on, you know, underdeveloped. And I don't think it's as simple as like 15,000 words per character. It's just, you know, it, it can't work out that way. And some are going to rise to the top more than others, but you just don't want any of them to be completely underdeveloped. So yes, I mean, Mitch is a non-Jewish, late 40s newspaper man. I don't have a lot in common with him, but I find the things, I, I give him traits that I can relate to, you know, and I, or I, you know, he has a little bit of a tough time relating to his son because he's very into sports and his son is not. Now that's not a dynamic we have in our family, but it's something I've certainly observed other friends where there's a, a father who's like a total sports nut and the son is not interested at all. And it can be difficult. So I just decide I'm going to do that for them. And I, I park that into Mitch's backstory. Right. 
So um, I'm one of four and I'm also a parent of four. So I'm always fascinated by family dynamics that repeat from generation to generation and what's handed down to us through a genetic imprint and what evolves more organically. Um, but I thought it was really fun in your book to see some of the, I don't know if, the, if repetition is the right word, but some of the, but the repetition of the dynamics say between Elise and, and Freddie, and then Rachel and Darius, uh, the, the competition between siblings, those insecurities between siblings. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that, a family dynamic well, and generation yeah. generation. I think we all like to say that like, we're not gonna repeat the mistakes of our parents and we're gonna be the better, the, the better version 2.0. But I had like a taste of my own medicine just yesterday because like I grew up in a house where my mother was like, really wanted to make sure I was always very presentable. And so she like, I had a perfect bow for every dress and I had a perfect shoes and I, you know, to, wanted my hair to look nice and this and that. And I'm like, I'm, I think I'm so much more relaxed with my daughter. But meanwhile, <laughs> we are going to a little gathering uh, yesterday and I overhear my daughter, my husband says to her, Lila, you have to get ready. What are you going to wear? And she goes, it doesn't matter what I pick. Nothing will be good enough for mommy. <laughs> I was like, what? And I realized that like, it is exactly the same pattern repeated and I didn't even realize it. And so, you know, I love to write about that stuff, you know, and it, that certainly happens a lot in the floating Bellmans where, you know, Elise is doing the things that drove her crazy about her mother, Annette. She's doing the exact same thing to her kids, you know, because you can't fight nature. Right, 100%. Um, so, and, you know, of course, all of those characters are carrying these secrets that are just simmering below the surface and eventually sort of boil out. Do you think most people carry secrets through their life? Well, not really, but it does make for a better novel, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> well, and this book definitely brings out the amateur therapist. Yes. Sure. Yes. Well, I mean, no, I don't, I don't think everybody does, but you want to write about the more interesting families that they do. I mean, I think, I think that as I, I, I've learned, like I'm a big sharer and I tell everything to everybody. And I, I, as I'm getting more mature, I realize like, I don't, it's okay to have, you know, some element of, Secrets may be a strong word, but like, I don't need to share everything with everyone. And so maybe that's part of getting older, that as you mature a little bit, you might have some things that you've kept to yourself. But like, from a writing perspective, you're going to want to pick the more extreme things. You're going to want to write about the wife that bankrupts the family. You're going to want to write about, you know, the teenager with the married boyfriend. You know, there are you want, you know, you want the books to be entertaining. So you pick the juicy stories like a soap opera. Um, but I don't think that there are any secrets in the floating Bellmans that are unrealistic. Um, so another question that's come in from one of the audience participants is, are the characters based on real people? Oh, no. I mean, I, if I want anyone to speak to me, like the answer is clearly no. <laughs> I, they're all from my imagination. I'm very creative. Um, so this is following up on a little bit of the earlier conversation. It's really more of an author lifestyle question. Um, but Virginia Woolf, of course, wrote the famous book, A Room of One's Own. And I'm just wondering, is it difficult as a wife and mother to carve out the time and mental space to write? And how do you balance obligations at home with that need to be creative and have the freedom to write, um, especially during COVID, when, as you say, we're all home right. together? It's, it's been hard and I appreciate the deadlines that have been imposed on me um, because now that I have books that I've sold that are on contract and I, they're due, that are due at a certain time, it really forced me. And the first two or three months of coronavirus, I was not productive at all. I couldn't focus. My children were in school. I was running their Zooms. I was constantly replacing the toner and the printer for all their thousand worksheets. And I... And then when school ended in June, I felt like I could finally write again and I could really work. But I have some help out here a little bit and um, my husband's helpful and he understands like that the weekends, I have to work a lot because he's not working on the weekends and so he can help take care of the children and then I have to work a ton on the weekends. So yeah, it's hard. It's a lot better when they go to school all day and I can write and then when they come home from school, I'm done. But 
it's just not the case right now. I mean, I asked for my very first extension in my entire career during coronavirus. I've never even asked for a single extra day. And then this time I asked for two more months. And when I asked my editor, who's also a mother home with her children, she's like, oh, thank God, because there was no way I was going to be able to read it any time before August. So of course you can have it. You know, she was so grateful. So yeah, it's hard. I'm really, my kids are starting school August 31st. I, with the help of God, they will stay there at least until Thanksgiving. So we'll see. Right. Um, okay. Well, I don't have other questions. I'm, oh, you know what? One more just came in um, and it says, have you read Lori Gottlieb's book? Maybe you should talk to someone. Um, and do you still have time to read? Oh, it's a double question. And do you still have time to read and love it as much now that your profession is writing? I did read, maybe you should talk to someone. I thought it was very charming. Um, I actually listened to it as an audio book, which I really enjoyed. Um, it lent itself very well to the audio format. It was charming. I, I, that's another one that I don't totally understand, like why it has captured the zeitgeist. It's good. It's interesting. Frankly, like if I was a therapist writing a book, like I would have thought there'd be some more juicy stories, but it it was good. It it was a charming read. And she's a very likable person. I've watched her, you know, do in podcasts and interviews and I'm happy for her success. And certainly had a challenging life. I know she's a single mother, had a child on her own. Um, And yes, I have time to read. I read a ton. I read, I try to read, I read for work. Like right now in addition to the works that I'm doing myself, I'm writing a romantic comedy with a writing partner. I happen to never read romantic comedies. So now I'm tearing through some very popular ones so that I can get my finger on the pulse. And I also listen to audiobooks. So I try to read, I would say I try to read and listen to a book, like probably one new book. I read one book and I listen to one book like every two weeks, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say. Very good. Um, well, thank you again. The book is just phenomenal. It's a laugh out loud <laughs> book. I, I haven't quite gotten to the end, but I'm loving every page. Um, it's a great pandemic read to relax and enjoy a little bit, but it really does capture yeah. so, so many compelling family dynamics. So in addition to the laughs, there's a lot of substance to it. Um, thank you. Books so- available on Amazon. And I also was able to get it at the corner bookstore on Madison and 93rd. Yeah. If anybody is up that way too. That's a great bookstore. That's a great bookstore. So- so Alyssa, before you go, I wanted to, uh, one or two more questions and then Rabbi uh, might have something to say. But uh, I wanted to know, so, so it sounds like you're doing a book a year, basically what I'm hearing, right? Well, now it's more like a book every two years. So I'm trying With to get- other idea. projects in between. Right, so I'm trying to get an idea. Um, first of all, very few people, you know, get one book out. So, you know, five books is a major accomplishment, but maybe if you could share with us like, you know, where do you see it going in the next 10 to 20 years? Do you see like this being, uh, you know, doing 15, 20 books in your lifetime? I'm just curious, you know, you know, what, 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 what yeah. you're asked, right? In other words, some people would stop and say, you know, I've done five books. They're great books. They're very popular. Diana. Uh, uh, yeah, Diana, right? <laughs> so I'm trying to understand, you know, is it like uh, a passion, you know, certain careers like, be, you know, never end, you know, it sounds like this is something that, you know, until 120, yeah. you're going to be very passionate about and something you're going to hopefully be doing forever. So I kind of wanted yeah. to hear your thoughts on I, that. I, I think this is my forever career with some pivots along the way. I've had, I've written a children's book that I'm shopping around now. I'm now writing a book with a writing partner, this romantic comedy because we're sharing the work, splitting it exactly 50-50, it's going very quickly. So we should be able to write a book a year, the two of us. So I'd ideally have, you know, let's say this writing partner and we churn out a book a year and then I have my own works, maybe hopefully the children's book sells and I have that. I hope that the more my career goes and I meet more people, maybe someone will bring me on to write as part of a television you know, part of a writer's room and write for a TV show. I mean, I would love to try my comedic voice for television. And that would be amazing. I mean, it's mostly based in LA, but you never know. And uh, yeah, I I think I will always be a writer, just 
maybe expand my repertoire. Maybe we'll have you do some comedy at the new members dinner. Sure. We don't have Modi or uh, Elon <laughs> Gold. Uh, the last question I have uh, is, so, um, you know, the world has changed a lot during COVID. It, uh, the world is definitely unstable, as we all know. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, is it different being, you know, a Jewish author? Uh, are there positives, negatives? Does it make a difference? I, I just don't know the industry. So I wanted to get your perspective or people that are on the call. I mean, uh, I'm assuming you never faced anti-Semitism. You never had any issues. So um, is it the same? Do you feel like a good book is a good book no matter who writes it? And, and, and it's a very fair world? I feel very lucky because a lot of my books have a lot of Jewish content and I have not faced any anti-Semitism. If anything, we are the people of the book and being a Jewish author that writes about Jewish themes has really helped my career. There's an organization called the Jewish Book Council that exists exclusively to bolster the careers of Jewish authors. And they've sent me on book tours around the country to Jewish communities outside of New York that are much smaller. And I've been to lots of random states and, I, and spoken in JCCs and places that I never thought I would be at and meeting Jewish communities in different part outside of New York has been fascinating, really edifying for me because we're not all the same in different parts. I've even learned the differences between West Coast of Florida Jews versus East Coast of Florida Jews and they are not the same. And I've hung out with lots of Midwestern Jews and California Jews and it's fascinating. Um, I have not encountered anti-Semitism Although I will say, it's interesting, as I'm writing a book now with someone else, and she is not Jewish, and her last name is Mackenzie, and we are trying to come up with a combined name that we might just write under both of our names, or we might come up with a pen name for the two of us. I don't think Friedland should be the, I think we'd be better off being Mackenzie, because ultimately you want to make the biggest splash possible. I think we just still live in a world where it's probably better to not have the Jewish last name. Sorry to end on a cynical note, but no, 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 we just talked it. about. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. So, so the, the, uh, you made me think of one more thing. I apologize. So, do, do you um, have you spoken at colleges? Like, in other words, do you try to inspire other authors? Have you, you know, mm -hmm. clearly, a lot of people have your passion, but don't have the, in my opinion, the courage, the confidence, or the execution to do it. So, you know, clearly, hopefully people who participated tonight will be inspired, but I'm just curious, you know, maybe it's not something you want to do now, but have you spoken at schools or colleges to potential authors? I, well, so I, I just taught my first semester at Yale. I was teaching. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was great. So I taught creative writing, novel writing at Yale, which was awesome because I went there and it was really fun to be back on campus. And... I would say I taught, I had 14 students and only one of them was an English major and wanted to be a full-time writer. Interestingly, like I got computer science majors and econ and biology majors. And what was so impressive slash incredibly intimidating was how well-rounded these students were because the computer science majors were turning in unbelievable works of fiction and the biology majors, the pre-med students. It was so, it's very hard to get into college now, I've learned, because <laughs> these students are unbelievable and talented in many areas. Um, so actually there were two students, one actually from New York City that went to Dalton and another student from Texas that do want to be novelists and we've kept in touch. I actually had them read my novel that's coming out next year and proof it because I thought it was going to be good experience for them to see the process and like get into the weeds of a novel. And they gave me suggestions that were really helpful, um, even though they're, you know, all of 20 years old, but they're very bright and mature. And so I was there, I went back to college to teach because I feel that this is a career that's really tricky to go into. And there aren't a lot of mentors on a college campus. Like if you want to go work at Goldman Sachs, it's very easy. They come to campus, they take you out to a fancy dinner, they ply you with alcohol and tell you about your $200,000 a year salary. It's very tempting. You want to go to law school, take the LSAT, it's a path. You want to be a novelist, you're on your own, which I really 
felt sorry for people who have this passion. And I wanted to go back and not only teach the craft of writing, but also teach the business of publishing. So when I created my syllabus, it's 75% craft and it's 25% now how do I actually do this? Oh, I think that's great. So you're really mentoring other future authors yes. to get into the field, which sounds like there's no formal mentorship uh, available you know I, I, as far as i know i mean i hope i not sure when i'll be back to teach another semester because like i don't really want to teach on zoom sadly um, my semester was interrupted midway through and we had to transition to teaching on the computer and the conversation was nowhere near as rich as it was as when we were gathered in the same room so and also my own safety and my family's safety like i'm really not so keen maybe to travel to new haven to teach until this whole mess is behind us. But when it is behind us, I will be back to teach because I loved it. Great. So, so first of all, this was amazing. I mean, uh, yeah. I felt we learned so much from you. Appreciate your time. And, and we're also very grateful for uh, giving us William to help us out <laughs> through a, a tough time and a transition in the synagogue. So I want to publicly thank you on, on record for that. And I want to turn it over to the rabbi if he has any closing thoughts. Larry Babbage. Uh, Alyssa, thank you so much. You know, I think you gave us all a glimpse into a world that uh, none of us know much about other than uh, clicking on Amazon. So it was very, uh, very uh, enlightening and interesting. You know, listening to you uh, speak, you know, uh, um, occurred to me that uh, even though you're writing fiction and you're trying to entertain people with the humor, you know, it sounds like you're really putting a tremendous amount of effort to try to give some type of a uh, personal message, uh, psychological message related to people's life for all the different uh, characters or people out there that you in the world, meaning that you're not just writing from a woman's perspective, you're looking for a father and a son who, who don't get, don't uh, see this eye to eye in terms of uh, sports and uh, an elder perspective and uh, someone who's older, their perspective. And it seems like you're trying to find some type of a message that relates to their personal life that they could take away from the, their reading, meaning that even though it's technically a fiction and it's, um, it's um, uh, for entertainment, it sounds like your approach um, is trying to give some type of like uh, inspirational message or insight or, or um, um, comfort to, to different various people out there through your book. So I want to know if A, if you thought that was correct and B, you know, um, you mentioned you're not sure why certain books you know, take off and other books don't. You see this with movies as well, right? Certain movies become like iconic and like change people's lives and Star Wars and, you know, these things become like, uh, you know, you know, people, you know, view it as part of who they are and other movies are entertaining, but they don't have the same level of personal connection. And I always thought that the reason is because those movies have become like legendary, have some type of message that people walk away with that they actually carry through with their, with their lives. And right. those, those are just entertainment are, are great movies. You know, you like it, but you're not necessarily thinking about it, you know, five days later. You're not getting all right. rolled up online when the, the sequel is not like the first one, right. you know. Um, so I want to know what you thought about those two. Uh, I mean, look at the Bible. The right. Bible is <laughs> quite, a, quite a long tale. <laughs> I bring that up because, you know, from a <laughs> perspective, that's what, you know, you know rabbis yeah. try to do. They try to give a presentation that leaves a person with some type of message in the personal life that they could take away with. So yeah. I want to know from your perspective, is it just entertainment or is it really like entertainment, but I want, you know, uh, uh, someone, you know, and that's why you, you mentioned you're going to all different perspectives, someone to walk away with some type of personal yeah. message in their life that, that they could enhance their life in one way or another. Right. I, I don't think there are, there are very few books that are tremendously successful that don't have a deeper meaning and a deeper message. So, I mean, I could think of a few and I could be cynical and I could say this was trash and it's still selling, but that's a, it's a genuine major minority of books. The ones that really go on and on and keep selling and people keep talking about are the books that have a deeper meaning and have a theme that resonates and a universal theme and a timeless theme. Those are important and I certainly strive for that. And you know, I use the humor as a tool to deal with deeper issues. So right. certainly is my intention. And it sounded very good when you said it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we really all enjoyed and uh, 
you know, we look forward to more books coming out. And if you ever Thank need you. any inspiration, you know, we have a, we're, we're welcome to, to meet the, all of us to give character, uh, you know, inspiration. A lot of dynamics. Thank you. <laughs> in the synagogue, a lot of different personalities. Uh, <laughs> I think that's every synagogue. <laughs> well, William's going to help you after he's done. <laughs> I already hear all about it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you so much. much. Success. Have, Thank you so have much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.